Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Workforce Wednesday webinars. My name is Anissa Franklin. I am with the Urban League of Lexington, Fayette County, where I serve as the Chief Administrative Officer. It is my pleasure to welcome Ms. Priscilla McCowan, who's going to be speaking with us today about keeping that job. Now, before she comes, I want to take just a moment to thank our sponsors, which include Truist, uh, formerly known as bb and as well as Toyota Tusho, State Farm Insurance, as well as U.S. Bank. We thank all of them for investing in this webinar series, as well as our workforce development activities. Now, Workforce Wednesday webinars are a professional development series that helps diverse job seekers develop new skill sets that will enhance their careers and influence their personal and professional lives. Through these digital series, uh, we hope that anything that is said here today will definitely invest in your personal and professional growth. And without further ado, I want to welcome Ms. Priscilla McCowan to the screen. Hello. Well, hi, Priscilla. It is so good to have you here with us today. Uh, as I said, we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you want to pull up your presentation on how okay. to keep that job, we'll definitely turn things over to you and you can do as you please. <clears throat> All righty. Well, welcome to everyone um, who is out there. My name is Priscilla McCowan. I'm a human resource professional. I've been in the business for 25 years now. So I've uh, seen several things um, and I felt like I had something that I thought might be valuable to you all today. <clears throat> this one is entitled, Keep That Job, uh, Tips for Maintaining Steady Employment. Now, I know a lot of people out there in, in the work world who have some difficulty with this particular area, keeping a job. Um, for those of us who've been on the same job for 27 years or who have worked steadily for the last 40 years, <clears throat> this might be a foreign concept. But for people who have struggled a little bit with maintaining employment, I'm hoping that the tips today will be beneficial to you. So let's get started on this. And if you have questions, please um, put them in the chat box or uh, share them, and uh, some magical person there is going to read them. So please feel free to, to do that. All right, trying to figure out why I'm not going. Okay, so in order for me to share this information with you today, I'm going to do it as a case study. And so I'm going to look at one of my friends. Uh, his name is Eddie in this, that the name has been changed. Uh, Eddie is a 51-year-old African-American male with a high school diploma. This is not Eddie. This is a, a, a picture that I just pulled from being images, but Eddie is a real person. Eddie is not a stereotype. He is an individual who has had a life experience that may be familiar to some of you. So I wanna share that and I want to make sure that you understand that I've talked to Eddie, Eddie has my permission because Eddie understands that he has a story to tell and he has allowed me to uh, share his information uh, honestly and authentically in order to perhaps help somebody else. So whether you're a job seeker or an employer or someone who works with job seekers, I'm hoping that this information is uh, helpful to you. And the fact that this is real, this is a real live person who is a good friend of mine. And so at some points it may seem a little grim, but I promise this has a happy ending. So let's see uh, what Eddie's like. So here are some of Eddie's marketable skills. Now, if you look at it, and I'll run through that for, for those of you who may have difficulty reading this, he is, uh, he fancies himself as a landscaper. He loves landscaping. He, he has that yard that everyone is envious of. He keeps his grass high enough to cut twice a week. So it looks like carpet doesn't have any weeds in it. It's perfect. That's his 
passion. He loves mowing and landscaping and stuff like that. But he also, as, as a trade, he is a heavy equipment operator. He attended and got his certificate from a school in Shepherdsville uh, for heavy equipment operating. He has experience in road construction. He's also got manufacturing experience. He's worked in several uh, jobs in manufacturing. He has really good customer service skills because He's a real good people person. He loves people and he likes to talk and he's got that gift of, of gab. And he also has a really, really strong work ethic. So some of the things that he does super well is he, he arrives early for work. He'll leave late. He works the whole time he's there. He's not a lollygagger. He's none of those things that, that um, some employers are dealing with right now. He's not on his cell phone all the time. He's a good good, strong worker. So would you hire Eddie? Put that in the uh, Facebook chat or wherever you can put in, in a chat box and let me know if you would hire Eddie. He looks like he's got great skills, right? And if there are any comments, feel free to share them. Oh, hey, got it. hey Priscilla, Sorry. let me ask you, what position hey. is Eddie applying for? Uh, so so can, um, can, can I share that? Most of what Eddie loves to do and most of the jobs he will apply for are um, have road construction. That's a thing of his, a uh, road construction and manufacturing. That's where he tends to apply for jobs in okay. road construction and manufacturing. Let me, yes. let me ask you this other question. I'm James McFarland and I'll be asking some of these questions as they appear. That's okay. How can he, how can he get that? Um, information across that he's a, has a strong work ethic in the interview or in the application process? Well, he evidently is a really good interviewer because he he's pretty articulate in terms of what he brings to the table and some of the things that he focuses on when he's talking to a potential employer is the strong work ethic, the time and attendance issues, the um, really good um, worker. He's a worker. And a lot of employers today are really looking for people who will put in the time, who will actually give a whole day's work for a day's pay. So he's, they're looking for those kinds of skills in people. All right, so he looks like a good, pretty good candidate, right? Well, except Eddie also has some barriers to employment. And so when you look at his marketable skills, he looks like an excellent candidate. Now look at his marketable, his, his barriers to employment and tell me what you think now. Did it change your perspective of Eddie? So <clears throat> this is also equally true about Eddie. He is a former cocaine user. But he has been um, 20, probably 22 years clean. I'm real proud of him for that because remember, he is a friend of mine. He also has been an alcoholic and he's more than five years sober um, from alcohol addiction. He's had a felony conviction for unemployment insurance fraud. That has been expunged, but he had that felony for several years if you did a background check on Eddie. He also has several misdemeanor convictions for terroristic threatening, domestic abuse, wanton endangerment, drunk driving. Um, he was court ordered to uh, anger management treatment and, and he, was, he got a second DUI. So he was ordered to, uh, for counseling for, um, um, he had anger management treatment, but he also had counseling. Um, two separate occasions. He's had some issues in his family life. He has several children and he had a spouse and they had some uh, allegations of abuse and neglect. None of the children were removed from the home, but there was a social worker for a couple of years who had some oversight because of some things that were happening with the parents and their neglect for their children. Um, when he had the court ordered counseling that revealed a, um, a, a mental illness, which required um, medication management. 
So now what do you think? Well, let me ask this question about, about hiring Eddie. Mm -hmm. These things, the, he's, these negatives that are appearing in his, um, in, in this background scenario. Check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's when they will appear is in, when they do the They'll background They'll show up. They'll show up on his background check. Most of these things will show up on his background check. Okay. That was the question I had. How would the uh, employer know about these? But you said when they mm -hmm. do the background they, check. Most of them. Okay. Eddie's very honest. And Eddie will tell them some of these things. He will. If they ask, he will be very forthcoming with it. But if they do background checks, which most employers do now, uh, many of these things will show up. Okay. So they will know about it. Well, in the, in the uh, response to what I'm hiring, it just depends on how long he's been clear of most of these things. Right. If he was, you know, if right. Right. And for those of you out there who may have messy backgrounds, because there are a lot of people who have messy backgrounds, that does not mean you won't get hired. You might have to be a little pickier about where you apply for jobs, because there are plenty of people out there who are going to look at that and say, nope, absolutely not. But there are just as many, and perhaps even more, who will look at exactly what James said to look at. You look at how long have, 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 how long has it been since your last conviction? Are you on paper? Are you complying if you're on paper? If are you, what, what, what's the evidence I see that you're making some changes, that this is not still your life? Those are what, that's what an employer to see. Now, I happen to work for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And so when we have a situation like this, we get messy, messy background checks sometimes. And those are the questions that we ask. How long has it been? What's the likelihood of this reoccurring? Um, and we may have to ask some questions uh, of this candidate about some of these issues. And so um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get a job. So don't go into job seeking, assuming nobody's going to hire you if you look anything like my friend Eddie, because that is not true. It's not true. It's a myth. But you have to look for employers who are willing to ask you some questions about your messy background and accept some answers from you about that. So I think for some of us, it would actually change our minds and at least put the yellow caution, right? I think most people or most employers are like that. And that is a truth that he has had to deal with for many, many years. All right, so interestingly enough though, Eddie, I told you he interviews well, he is charming. He has a gift for finding good jobs, for finding, and by a good job, I mean a, a, a one with a livable wage income. He's had a few that paid minimum wage or $8 an hour, but most of the jobs he has had in his career have been livable wage jobs. So um, let's look at some of the jobs he's had since he was 21. He's worked in manufacturing a couple of times and, you know, note how long he's been employed in those jobs. I have um, how many, how long he was employed in that particular job as well. Um, he's been a road construction laborer for almost two years. Uh, he worked two summer seasonal jobs with a tree and mowing surface. He was a rail car inspector for three months concrete finisher helper for five months, uh, frontline retail for three months, feed manufacturing, landscape laborer for uh, a, a little over a year, concrete manufacturing, three months, road construction laborer, six months, paving company laborer, three months, auto parts manufacturing, two years, and his current job, is a road construction job. He's a highway equipment operator and he has been on that job for all, right at about four years. Um, during, because he's had so many jobs, 
it, you know, he's had some bouts of unemployment. So in between that, he's still a hustler. He, he does mowing and landscaping for people when he can get jobs. And he also has like a car washing business. He'll car, wash your car, detail it, wax it, all that kind of stuff. So he tried not to be idle during his moments of unemployment. So that break in there is, is, is intentional. All right. And here's why. Because Gerald got, I mean, Eddie got fired or laid off and not called back for every one of these jobs. Every one of those jobs he got fired from. All right. And if you look, he hadn't spent more, the, the, the most he had been on a job was two years until a few years ago. That break represents a time when he made a change and that change stuck because he tried for years and make making a change after you see where you are and you reflect on your work history or you reflect on your behavior and you see a need to make a change you need a break because it starts a new life for you in employment. So I think James has, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I have a question that I think Anissa may have a question also, but let me ask you, as an HR person, if you see a resume like this with such short-term employment, would you think it's better to write that resume in a way in which it doesn't show that? Or do you think this is more harmful than helpful showing that he's not uh, been able to stay on a job as long? Here's the kick. <clears throat> however you write it, an HR person can see that. You know what I mean? I mean, we teach people, because I used to teach, I, we used to work at a college. So we would teach people who had like gaps in employment to, to write it chronologically or to write it as, as, you know, in a different way so that it didn't show the gaps. Guess what? HR people can see those gaps. So however you write it, we can still see those gaps. We can still see them. And so since we can see them, we're going to become inquiring minds and want to know why, right? Now, if you look at uh, Eddie's work history, what, you, what it looks like to an employer, to me, as, a, as an HR person, is he didn't make it off probation too much, you know? And that's the truth. That's a true statement. Uh, he didn't make it off probation a lot, or he got fired pretty early on. And so even with this, what I think, what I would encourage job seekers to be able to do is to be honest with an employer about why this has happened. I, I think that's your best bet because if you try to, um, if, you, if you try to come up with lots of excuses as to why this has happened, and those excuses are external to you, then what that employer is going to hear is an, an employee or potential candidate who cannot accept responsibility for their own behavior and can't accept responsibility for their own life experience. And that's a problem for an employer because if you can be straight about who you are and what's happened to you and what you've done and the mistakes you've made, you're honestly going to fare better than if you said, well, I, I've had some, some, some difficult times and I've had some, some struggles, but um, that's not a reflection of who I am. You've got to show people, you've got to talk to people, you've got to prove to people that, that did, your worth the risk because honestly there's no way an employer is going to look at this and not think that person is at least a little bit of a risk but guess what every person you hire I don't they can look like they are fabulous on paper and we've done it we've hired fabulous people on paper and they turned out to be nightmares and you can hire somebody like Eddie who looks nothing like perfection or like you even be a good person and he may turn out to be your better employee because you're taking a calculated risk 
with Eddie because Eddie, you know what Eddie's about. You've seen some of Eddie's work history. So you know some of the issues because you've talked to him in the interview. And so you know some of the issues that Eddie's had it with respect to work. And these people with these beautiful resumes that look wonderful, you do not know what they were like. And if they quit right before they got fired, it's gonna look like they resigned and everything's perfect, right? Well, maybe not. So you're always taking a risk when you hire an employee. I don't care if it's a $100,000 job or a minimum wage job, it is a risk. This is a calculated risk because you have more information about Eddie than you do about the average candidate who has not had a messy background. You just do. Let me um, ask you this question, looking at his uh, yes. background. Uh -huh. What time frame would you give as an employer to uh, to see how, that he's been clear? I mean, would you be looking for something where he's not uh, where he's been steady on a job for you know a couple of years, or he hadn't got in trouble for a couple of years? I mean, what are you looking for to show to give you an indication that he is on the right track? I would look at how long has he been on his most recent job, but I would also look at how long has it been since he's been in trouble. You know, and if it's just been, um, a, you know, a six months or so, if he's, and, and, it, and actually, and every, a lot of people might disagree, but if you get somebody that's on paper, they're on probation, they're on parole, call that probation parole officer and get a reference. We just did that. We just hired somebody who was on, he's on lifetime paper. I mean, they're on paper forever because they're on the sex abuse registry. And um, ordinarily it's like, oh, no, sir, we're not hiring that person. But they wanted to hire him because they, you know, he's a relative of somebody. So that person vouched for them. And so what we did in that situation was we called their um, parole officer and talked to them. And she gave him a good reference and said he's, you know, he's been, he's, he's following, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing and he's worth a chance. So um, that, that was something that, that, and he's current. I mean, he's still, he's, he's not in prison, but he's on paper. And so you, there are things that you can look at and a, and a good recommendation from uh, your parole officer or your probation officer is helpful because their reputation's on the line too. And, you know, they'll tell you straight up, nah, I wouldn't do that <laughs> with that one. Not, not yet, they're not ready. But this one gave a good recommendation. And so we were able to hire somebody that we ordinarily would have had real um, concerns about hiring. So. Um, Priscilla, let me ask you, um, so the gaps in employment, why is that an important piece that um, would be employers look for? Well, employers look for consistency, right? And most of us, whether we admit it or not, we're looking for someone we can count on, someone who's stable. And quite frankly, Eddie doesn't look very stable. He doesn't. Now, Eddie is stable, actually, because I know Eddie. He is very stable, um, but, but he doesn't look that way. And so when employers are looking for stability and someone that, that they can count on to be there, they're going to look at this and say, hmm, they're not dependable. Hmm, they, hmm, what kind of problems is this? And, and I might be a jaded HR person because when I see a work history like this, it's like, hmm, I wonder what they're like at work. I wonder what problems. I, I'm all into, wonder why this has happened. Wonder why this has happened. And it's not because it's, it's to exclude them. It's to know what you've got going in to know what you're going to be dealing with, knowing that it might not be like that at all, because it, there could be a million reasons. It could be like, like Eddie's history. If you look, he's had six years, about six years of continued employment. And guess what? That auto parts manufacturing job that he had for two years, he gave a proper notice of resignation. That's the first time ever, a proper notice of resignation and went to another job because he found another job and he'd never done that. 
And that's exciting, kind of, because when you think of somebody who's gotten fired from every other job, and now they're actually having the ability to seek another job, get another job, and give proper notice at this job. So he left in good standing. He left in good standing. They'll hire him back. Other questions? On a resume, how far should a person go back? I mean, we reference, or you just referenced six years here. So I wonder, do you stop after like 10 years or, you know, because at some point I feel like Eddie's not going to have to go back to all the ones that I he would was go talking. back. I would go back 10 years, but that's just a recommendation because people need to know that you've had stuff. Now, I'm an inquiring mind, so I'm going to ask what you do before then, but yeah, I'm just being nosy. You know, um, but but I, I think, you know, some some employers are five years, some are seven. I think ours are seven years, um, 10, just to be sure, you know, because people do need to know what you've been doing. If Especially remember, Eddie's 51. And so with Eddie being 51, he's had 20 more years of experience past that 10 that you know, he, he would give. So inquiring minds might want to know. Any other questions? No? Okay. So let's move on. So he's, he has a, a knack for getting these really good jobs that pay decent and, you know, he's kept one for the last six years. So what do you think are some of the reasons Eddie was fired and you all can write in the chat box some of the reasons you think uh, Eddie may have been fired from his jobs. One uh, comment says his anger and another says his overall attitude. And I also have one that says his home life. Okay, okay. All of the above. Here are some reasons, here I categorized the reasons because there were several, but here are the reasons he was terminated from his positions. Early on, it was drugs. He lost a couple of jobs for drugs. Bad attitude. Now, a bad attitude might mean a whole bunch of things. And I'm going to share some of the things that he was doing that I think would fall into a bad attitude when I talk about some lessons that he's learned. He walked off a job in anger. He got mad. Anger was a problem. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely a problem for him uh, for many years. Um, he did not successfully complete probation on some of his jobs. Um, this is the number one though. He had conflicts with coworkers that became disruptive in the workplace. That may, may include anger. It may include um, uh, other kinds of behaviors that caused him to get terminated. But um, can I tell you as Priscilla, the HR lady, completely unnecessary reasons for getting terminated. You should not be getting terminated for any of these reasons. If you get terminated because you can't do the job and you have poor performance, that's one thing. But if you get, if you get fired from your job because you can't get along with people, no, 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 no. No, that should not be happening. Um, however, are you aware that most people who get terminated from their employment get terminated because they can't get along with other people or because not or because they have that bad attitude or because they're just difficult to work with? That's why most people get fired. I think that's number two now. I think theft is number one, but I think that's the number two reason. It, for long, for decades, it was the number one reason. People were not people, people were not able to sustain employment because of poor interpersonal communication skills. And so that, sh that does not have to exist. You can do something about that. It can get better. It can get a lot better and it got better for him. So. What are some of the things that turned Ed, Eddie around? Well, um, part of it was just after a few years, it's just like, I'm sick of me. I am sick of me and my behavior and what I'm doing. And I think it's other people, but I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but something has to change. 
So what changed for him? Counseling. Counseling was a big breakthrough for him. And he didn't want to go to counseling because he, he wouldn't even talk to the counselor the first time. He didn't even want to do it. He didn't, he didn't want, he went kicking and screaming, but he was court ordered. So guess what? He could go to counseling or he could go to jail. So he chose to go to counseling. And so um, in counseling, once he finally got into it and actually saw the benefit of it, they were able to um, diagnose him with a medical condition that was causing a lot of these issues. It caused the substance abuse. It was a major reason for the anger issues. And so they were able to put him on some medication that substantially decreased his angry outbursts and his just overall acting a full behavior. Now, Let May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I cannot stress to you enough, if, if, if you look, if, if you are somewhat like Eddie, or if your family member is somewhat like Eddie, please, please, please don't be ashamed to get counseling. Counseling can make a huge difference in your life. Let you me ask to, you a question on, on, on that counseling, to, on that counseling yes, perspective. Now, yes, sir. Eddie's was court ordered. Let's say you <laughs> are at work and you realize you need some type of counseling. Should you approach your human resource or your manager to let them know? Or you, you, would you think that would be a detriment to your employment by doing that, to let them know well, that you're counseling? It should not be a detriment. If you say, I believe I need some counseling services and your company has an EAP. Um, EAP? Uh, Assistance, an EAP, an employee assistance program that helps um, employees um, get the counseling services they need, whether it's addiction or it's family counseling or financial counseling, any of those kinds of things that come to work with us every day, even though we try to leave it at the door, um, make use of those services. Make, that's what they're there for. They're not there to judge you. And if they're judging you, they're in the wrong profession. They're there to help you because it is in an employer's best interest for people who need help to get help so that they can do their jobs without having to worry about their finances or their kids or, or their substance or getting found out for their substance abuse issues. So um, in, in his situation, his was court ordered, but if your employer has one or go to comp care, go to comprehensive care, or go to your, if you have a, 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 have a, a place of faith, if you have a place of faith, go there, try to get some help. Don't, don't suffer in silence. Don't recognize that you need some help and not ask for help. Ask somebody, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who can help you get what you need. Don't be afraid, call the Urban League. Shameless plug, call the Urban League. They'll help you find what you need to get the services you need because no one should have to suffer and lose jobs because when they could have had some medication or they could have had some talk therapy that helped them get through a difficult time. And um, Eddie had a very difficult background um, that, that counseling was beneficial for not everything, but another area that was very beneficial to him was his faith. Now, I can't talk about Eddie's life without talking about Eddie's faith, so I hope nobody's offended because his faith is very important to him. Eddie is a Christian, a practicing Christian, um, but, and I'm gonna get killed for this because he's gonna watch this and he's gonna get killed, I'm gonna get killed for this, but the truth is, he was straddling the fence, and even he admits that. And he would go to church and, and be around church folk and act one way, and then he'd go to work and act like a fool. He'd do other things. He'd say what he wanted to, and he'd do what he wanted to. And, and um, I'm a friend of his, so I became his HR mentor, and I would tell him, look, you are a Christian 24-7, 365 days. 
everywhere you are. There's no place you go that you should not be engaging in Christian behavior and Christian conduct. And that means at work too. And that was a hard sell because I, I've known him since about 2010 and I've been his HR advisor since 2010 because when I met him, he didn't have a job. And, and it has been a struggle. The change, the transformation has been a struggle. And I, he, we have had some moments where, because I'm a straight shooter and I'm going to tell you the truth about what's going, what I see and what's going on. And if you ask me, and he would ask, and he didn't want my answer. He wasn't ready for that answer, but eventually he became ready for the answer. And so his faith though, getting, getting closer to God, getting more um, aligned with scripture in his everyday walk in life made a huge difference also. What else made a difference? A support system. Um, I'm part of his support system and he, uh, he found some people. He found a deacon at his church and he found um, a couple of other friends who became his support system because if, if you have ever had any experience with addicts, they probably burn their bridges with their family. And you've gotten to the point where they don't, your family doesn't trust you, even if it looks like you're changing because it's looked like that before and it was not real, they don't believe it. So he really did not have his family as his uh, primary support system when it was time for him to truly make that change. Now, I think they've largely come around, but once, once you've dealt with an addict and they, they've done things and they betrayed your trust, it's really difficult to, to get it back. And that's just the way it was. So thankfully he had other people who were supporting him and rooting him on and telling him the truth. Because one of the things that he needed most was truth. He needed somebody to tell him the truth about how he was behaving at work and what that looked like from an employer's perspective. And he really hadn't had somebody who uh, was doing that in a meaningful way. They would, they would put him down, they would criticize, but they wouldn't say, this is what it looks like from an employer. And this is what's going to happen if you do that, because that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So those are the three things that turned things around for Eddie. And I, I don't want you to go in, if you're in that situation, I don't want you to go in thinking, oh, it's easy. Oh, okay. So I'll just go to counseling and I will join a faith and I will find some new friends. And there you go. I'm fixed. No, it's a process. It's a process. Even to this day, there are times when uh, Eddie still struggles with things. Call me this morning. Honest to God, could not make this up. Call me this morning. And he said, I'm really angry and I know you're going to disagree with me, but I'm going to tell you what happened. So, you know, I told you he is a construction worker. So he got really mad because today they have a prevailing wage job, which means more money, right? And he wanted to use a particular piece of equipment and his boss said no. And he put someone who just started, he's been working 18 year old person who's been working for six months on uh, this particular piece of equipment. He calls so mad about it. And it's like, so, okay, so, okay. So why do you think you did that? And it's like, he just gave me some yes answer and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. Um, so are you supposed to be on the roller? No, not necessarily. It's like, okay. So why did he say you couldn't be on the uh, roller? The, the equip, piece of equipment is called roller. And he said, well, he said, you just need to trust me, Eddie. Do you have any reason at all to believe that it's discriminatory in any way? Um, well, no, not really. Okay. Um, he just doesn't want me to have the maximum prevailing wage. That's what it is. Now, I don't know if that's true. It might be true. I don't know if it's true. But 
all I could tell him was he needed to just work with that. And this was one of those moments where um, it may not be fair, but it's not illegal. And that's what I had to tell him. It may not be fair. You may not like it, but it's not illegal. It doesn't sound like the supervisor was violating any policies or any laws by um, letting someone else do the, the roller today. So he's going to have to make a decision, all right? Am I going to get myself fired for acting a fool today because I'm that mad about not getting to do the roller? Or am I going to go on to work and do the job that I am getting paid for? I am getting, you know, I'm getting fringe, but I'm not getting the prevailing wage. What am I going to do? And that's the difference between then and now. That gap that I put in the employment, that's the difference. He thinks about it now. He thinks about what happens if I keep on going like this? If I keep my, if I express my anger and I act a fool at work, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen is what has always happened in the past. I'm gonna get myself fired. And I don't think I wanna do that because I got a good thing. I make $26 an hour. And then at the minimum, that's my base pay now. I ain't trying to give that up. I'm gonna go on back to work. And sometimes we have to make those decisions because life is not always fair. Life, life, that's a given. Life's not fair. And sometimes at work, we have this illusion that, okay, life's not fair anywhere else in the whole world, but at work, life has to be fair. That's not true. That's not going to happen. It's not any more fair here than it is anywhere else. And I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying it's real. That's just what we have to deal with when we come to work every day. I have things in, in my life. It's like, I'd rather not do that. That ain't fair, you know, but I go on because, hey, that's not fair. And that's what he's had to come to the realization of is that life is not always fair because prior to that realization, he was notorious for making excuses. Um, do, do you all have any questions or do you all have anything? It looks like there's a chat. No, we're good. Okay. All right. I'll continue on then until you all have questions. So here are some of his excuses. The first thing he would always say is everything is discrimination. It's either discriminating against me. Um, I'm a black man. I'm dark skin. I'm this, I'm that, that, and the other. Guess what? The HR lady says everything is not discrimination. Honestly, the reasons um, that, that he was terminated from his job, they're not discriminatory reasons. A bad attitude is not discriminatory. Um, not being able to get along with people, that's not discrimination. And I, I, I actually know discrimination because I've worked in discrimination. I've been an investigator. I've done this for 20 years. So I actually do know, but I know also that discrimination happens. And we may not ever be able to prove it. I know that too. But what I would encourage employers and would-be job seekers out there to do is to recognize that what I don't need to do is set myself up for a situation where I'm about to get myself fired. And I might call it discrimination, but it's really not discrimination. So when you know discrimination exists, don't add to it. Don't add fuel to it. Don't give them reasons to do stuff. Because my, you know, my parents raised, raised us um, right or wrong. They raised us to be better, faster, and smarter than other people because that, that's the time I, I grew up in. And in, if you are a person of color in the United States, in Kentucky, you had to be better, faster, and smarter just to compete. I don't know that that's not still true. I believe that's still true. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that we are not giving people reason to, to get rid of us, to, to, dis, to discipline us, to view us negatively. And there are a lot of things you can do to hurt yourself, but there are a lot of things you can do to help yourself. Another reason, um, another thing that he would say all the time, well, they just hate on me. They just hate on me. They, they just hate, they just jealous. They just hate on me. 
Really? They're just hating on you? Um, here's a truth. Most people at work don't care about you at all. And that's just the truth. They don't. They don't care about you for real. I mean, you'll have your circle of friends. Most people don't care about you. They care about you as, as life or death, a human being. They don't want anything to happen to you. But you are just not a factor to most people. And the only time you become a factor is when you are impacting someone else's ability to get their job done. And we would love to say, work is king by all. Oh, we just love each other. You don't have to love your, the people you work with. You don't have to do that. You got a job to do. Do your job. And most people will leave you alone if you do your job. Now, is that every time? No. But is it most times? Yes. So <clears throat> if you're the common denominator in every one of these scenarios, in all of those jobs that Eddie had, he was the common denominator. So if, if, if you're the common denominator, what should that say to you? What questions do you need to be asking yourself about your situation? Hmm, what's my role in this? Am I, am I somehow contributing to making these things happen? Is it me? Yes, you need to ask yourself those questions. Honestly, you do. James, do you have a question? Yeah, um, what advice would you see? I see where Eddie matured. He had to bump his head a couple of times before he finally got the message and he matured. And it looks like he became um, or is becoming a uh, um, valuable asset to his workforce. Absolutely. But what advice would you give a young person, 21, 22, who hasn't matured yet and who's facing all these obstacles that Eddie faced when he was 21? I actually have some, some tips some things that Eddie had to learn. And if you will give me another slide or two, I'll share those tips with everybody, regardless of your age. Okay, all right. So Anissa kindly said, we need to move forward. All right, so again, I'm gonna send you back to Eddie's marketable skills. Eddie has fabulous skills. He has fabulous skills. And guess what? He doesn't have a college degree, but he still has fabulous work skills. So you don't have to have a college degree to have a great, um, a, a great resume. But he also has these barriers that are becoming less and less of a barrier as they're getting farther and farther behind in his history. So what are the lessons that Eddie had to learn? And James, this is the answer to your question. I would tell anyone, even kids who are going into the workplace for the first time, Eddie did not learn these skills immediately. It took him years and years to learn these skills, but these are some basic things that I would recommend to anyone. I, I've even had to say some of this to my nephews uh, from time to time. Life is not fair. Don't expect work to be any more fair than the rest of your life. It's not, and that's a harsh reality, but unfairness sometimes causes us to grow because guess what what you think is unfair now might not be unfair at all did it happen yeah good unfair does not mean illegal so there are things that can happen at work that may be perceived as unfair but they're not illegal so there's there's not a lot you can do about that if you act like a fool at work there will be consequences, especially if you are an African-American man or a person of color. There will be consequences. You cannot act a fool at work. You just can't. You can't act a fool. Another thing he had to learn, and this, he was real bad for this. You're not your supervisor's boss. Stop telling your supervisor what they ought to be doing. Stop telling your supervisor, well, I don't think so-and-so ought to be doing this, or I think that, you know, I don't think I should have to do this because I think so-and-so should be doing it. No, your supervisor is your supervisor, whether they're a good supervisor or a terrible supervisor, you can respect the position. And if they're the person that is charged with assigning tasks, that's their job. If they're doing their job, it's not your job. It's just not your job. Another thing he had to learn, unless you are a 
supervisor, you're nobody's supervisor. You're either the supervisor or you're not. And if you're not the supervisor, stop telling your coworkers how they ought to be doing their jobs and acting like you know everything, which is one of the things that he would do. And he meant well sometimes because he would be trying to tell, give them a better way to perform a task. They didn't want to hear that. If they don't want to hear that, don't tell them. Let, let them figure it out. You had to figure it out. Let them figure it out. Another thing he had to learn was stay in, stay in your lane. Just stay in your lane. You're not, you're not this person. You know, you're not here to advise this person. You're not here to advise that person. You're here to stay in your lane and do the job that you are getting paid to do. Do the work you're assigned to do and stop worrying about what other people are doing. That's one of the biggest uh, conversations we had have had over the years is him worrying about what other people are doing. We had that just this morning. So it never goes away, but it gives you the opportunity to think before you, you make a poor work decision. Um, just because your coworkers get away with it doesn't mean you're going to. And I'm just telling you the truth. Your coworkers might get away with it, but don't try it. If you know that's not, that's against policy. If you know that's just not what you need to be doing, don't do it. I don't care who you saw doing it, don't do it. Uh, if you think it is discrimination, please follow your company's policies um, for reporting discrimination. Don't, don't make accusations you can't prove. Don't be talking to your coworkers about, I think that's just discrimination, or I think it's just because I'm a, a black man or whatever. They can't do anything about it. If they're not EEO people, if they're not the HR people, they're not gonna do anything about it. And all you're gonna get is uh, reported back to the supervisor for what you said. And that's a common thing that, that has been happening with him. So what I, and that's, this is not in my slide, but what I, what I told him this morning is what I'm gonna tell you. Assume that you are being recorded in every conversation you have with anyone at work. And here's why. Um, one of the problems he, he is saying, they will be talking amongst themselves as coworkers, just kind of, you know, talking about work, sometimes griping, sometimes not. Well, his coworkers will go back and say, Eddie said this. And then the supervisor will come to Eddie and say, I heard you were upset about something. It's like, no, we were just talking. And it's like, shut your mouth, stop talking. Because if you, if, if you, if you treat every conversation as if you were being recorded, there are some things you are not going to say. And those are the things you don't need to say. And he admitted this morning, I asked him that question and he said, no, and it's like, well, don't say it. You don't need to say everything anymore. And you don't need to tell your coworkers everything. Um, which leads me into my next one. Stop running that mouth for no reason. No, that sometimes we talk too much at work and we get ourselves in trouble and we didn't even think we were doing anything except what everybody else is doing. No, it was perceived differently. And so therefore it was responded to differently. You don't have to be friends. You don't have to like your people you're working with. You just have to work with them. Pick your battles. Pick your battles. That's a big one. Pick every battle's not worth fighting. Choose your battles carefully. Now, I told you I had Eddie's permission to share this with you. And here's um, some things. Well, let me, let me do this one. Sometimes we do have legitimate complaints. Is it a safety issue? Are you or someone else in danger? That's a time when you definitely need to report that to your supervisor. If you believe it is discrimination, do you have any evidence to support that? That's what you share with your HR. The evidence that you believe um, supports your allegation of discrimination. But Eddie wants me to tell you, you must want to make the changes yourself. No one else can do it. His family spent years trying to get him to change. And until he was ready to change, it did not happen. Sometimes you have to change your influences. Eddie got a divorce. He moved to another town. He had to change all of his friends, all of them. Um, he, had all new, he has all new friends and acquaintances now. He had to do all of that. 
to get out of the, 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 the muck and mire he was in. Find a strong support system, counselor, family, friends, your house of faith, support group. He has that. So he has people that he can call and when he's, you know, about to make, maybe make a bad decision and somebody can reason through with that. And then exercise your faith. That's what he wants me to tell you. If you have a faith, exercise that faith uh, for real. If you don't have a faith, most people have at least a moral compass or you were raised with certain values of right, a sense of right and wrong. Follow that sense of right and wrong. There are uh, changes you can make. It can get better. It's not fatal if you have a messy background. So, but you have to believe that the change is possible. And if Eddie can do it, so can you. I wanna thank you all for participating today and thank you Urban League for the invitation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. All right. So, any final questions? I do not see any final questions, but I will say that was a fantastic presentation. Um, just so many tips and tricks that you uh, shared with us will be beneficial to those who are already working or those who are seeking employment, especially those who have that, uh, the challenges of the criminal background or the short employment history. And so uh, I see that James is, well, James was showing himself. I think he may have a question or two. Okay. No, no questions. I just was agreeing with Anissa. It was uh, good information because I work with a lot of people who are Eddie's, especially the young Eddie. So <laughs> that's why I wanted you to give them that advice as, what, as to what they can do now so they don't have to bump their heads all the way <laughs> down the line. Exactly. And they have to... Be willing to make the changes though, because it sounds like oh, nobody's listening to me and nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to hear what I'm saying. Yeah, we hear you. It's just that we, we're older and we're wiser and you need to take wise counsel. Yeah. So I think one of the good points too that you made is that that person has to be willing and ready to make that change themselves. Otherwise, you're just kind of wasting your breath. But I'm glad that, you know, Eddie has someone like you, and I'm sure we are probably that person to someone else that we can help them with those challenges that they are encountering from day to day. Absolutely. And you know, Eddie's story is great because Eddie has a home. Eddie has that perfect lawn now. His family, he, you know, he's, he's, his kids, the, that rec relationship was strained for several years. They are a tight family unit. He is the head of his family now, and he's really trying to be the dad they always needed uh, him to be, and he makes $26 an hour. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's not, you know, that's, that's, he's come a long way, but six years of continued employment is something even he didn't think he could do, but he did, because he made a few simple changes. He didn't change well, he made some pretty dramatic changes in the environment, but he made them and you can make them too. So Ms. McCowan, I wanna thank you so much for sharing with us today for our Workforce Wednesday webinar. Uh, for anyone who is interested uh, in seeing this recording played back, you can watch it on Facebook Live, of course. And then you can also uh, visit our website at ullex.org or follow the Urban League of Lexington on YouTube. And again, thank you and everybody have a great rest of the day.